Hi, and welcome back to my series of videos for General Chemistry 1. Last time, we talked about how to name thousands of chemical compounds, and also how to determine their formulas. But it turns out, not all chemicals can be named using that system. Today, we'll find out how to name hundreds of the rest of them. What you learn today will help you know the difference between a simple and safe anesthetic and a poisonous gas that's been used in manufacturing explosives. Mixing them up is definitely a mistake you'd never want to make. Last time, we talked about dozens of different compounds. You might not have noticed it, but they all had something in common. Remember a few videos ago, we talked about the difference between metals and nonmetals? All the chemicals we talked about last time had both metals and nonmetals in them. For example, one compound we looked at was lithium oxide. In this compound, lithium is a metal and oxygen is a nonmetal. Another compound we looked at was zinc sulfide. In that one, zinc is a metal and sulfur is a nonmetal. That pattern was even true for chemicals that had polyatomic ions in them. For example, we looked at aluminum acetate. It contained a metal, aluminum, and several different nonmetals. In these compounds, the metals usually had a positive charge, and the nonmetals had a negative charge. For this reason, they're called ionic compounds. But there are a lot of chemicals that don't contain a metal. For example, CO2 contains carbon and oxygen, and those are both nonmetals. Another example is P2O5, which also contains two nonmetals and no metals. Compounds like those, which don't contain a metal, are called molecular compounds instead of ionic compounds, and they need to be named using a slightly different system. Let's take P2O5 as an example. The first thing to notice is that in the formula, we usually write the element that's furthest to the left in the periodic table first. You're already familiar with that in the examples of water and CO2. We write water as H2O and not OH2 because the hydrogen is further to the left. To write the name of the compound, we write the name of the first element followed by the name of the second element, with the end of the second word replaced by the suffix ide, I-D-E. For this compound, that gives us phosphorus oxide. So far, that's just like the way we named ionic compounds. But this time, we need to add a prefix to each word so that we know how many of each element are present. The prefixes we need to use are summarized on this chart. So, for our example, our P2O5 molecule has two phosphorus atoms and five oxygens. So we'd use the prefix di for the phosphorus and penta for the oxygen. So the name of the molecule would be diphosphorus pentoxide. Notice that we don't use these prefixes when we're naming ionic compounds. So for example, this molecule is an ionic compound because it contains a metal, the aluminum. So the name of this compound is just aluminum oxide. We only use the prefixes when we have a molecular compound, where all the atoms are nonmetals. If we try it for this molecule, we have nitrogen and sulfur, so we start by calling it nitrogen sulfide. Now we need to look at the chart, and we see that we have four of each of both the nitrogen and the sulfur, so the prefix we want is tetra. So this molecule is called tetranitrogen tetrasulfide. The only exception to this rule is when we only have one of the first atom. Take CO2, for example. There's one carbon, which would usually mean we have a prefix of mono. But because carbon is the first element in the name, CO2 isn't called monocarbon dioxide. Instead, we leave the mono off and just call it carbon dioxide. We do still use the prefix mono if it belongs on the second word in the name. For example, this molecule has the formula CO. There's one of each element, so each one would usually get the prefix mono, but we leave it off the first word 
but not the second. So this would be called carbon monoxide. Being able to name molecular compounds like these is pretty easy, but it's an important skill, and it could even save your life. For example, take these three molecules. They all contain only nitrogen and oxygen, so we'd start by giving them the same basic name, nitrogen oxide. But the prefixes will be different for all three. This one is nitrogen monoxide. This one is dinitrogen monoxide. And this one is nitrogen dioxide. It's important to get these names just right. Nitrogen monoxide is a neurotransmitter. It's involved with the dilation of blood vessels and regulation of your heart rate. It's crucial for keeping you alive, and people who have problems synthesizing nitrogen monoxide in their bodies have serious health risks. On the other hand, dinitrogen monoxide is an anesthetic, sometimes also called nitrous oxide. It's still used as an anesthetic for some surgical procedures, especially in dentistry. The third molecule is nitrogen dioxide, and it's a very poisonous gas. It's a major air pollutant and is a byproduct of the manufacture of some explosives. It's definitely not something you'd want to get mixed up with the anesthetic N2O. We're almost done with our discussion of how to name compounds and write their formulas, but there are a couple more things to know. First, it turns out that many solid compounds actually have water bound in their crystal structure. For example, these two compounds are both copper 2 sulfate, but the one on the left contains molecules that are simply CuSO4. But in the compound on the right, there are actually water molecules attached to each copper 2 sulfate molecule. If you were to touch this substance, you'd find out that it isn't wet. The water molecules are actually part of the structure of the crystal. Each molecule of copper 2 sulfate in this compound has five water molecules attached to it. Compounds like that, which have water molecules attached to them, are called hydrates. Here's a picture of the crystal structure of this compound. This picture shows several molecules, so it can be a bit confusing to look at. But the important thing to notice is that here is a sulfate and here is a copper. Notice that the copper also has five water molecules attached to it. These other water molecules are attached to different copper atoms that are outside the frame of the picture. Because each copper sulfate molecule has five waters attached to it, we write the formula this way. The dot between the CuSO4 and the waters lets us know that the waters aren't separate from the copper sulfate. Instead, they're directly attached to it. So these two compounds have two different formulas, and they also have two different names. This one we already know how to name. It's copper 2 sulfate. Remember, as we discussed in the last video, we have to use the Roman numeral 2 to tell us the charge on the copper, because the copper is a transition metal. In the second molecule, the name needs to let us know about the five water molecules, so this copper is called copper 2 sulfate pentahydrate. The prefix on the last word tells us how many water molecules are attached. To decide what prefix to use, we go to the same chart we used when we were naming molecular compounds. Since there are five water molecules, we want the prefix penta, so this molecule is copper 2 sulfate pentahydrate. Let's look at one more example. Using the naming system we learned in the last video, we know that this molecule is nickel 2 nitrate. But this molecule is a hydrate because it has water molecules in its crystal structure. Since there are six of them, the chart tells us that this molecule should be called nickel 2 nitrate hexahydrate. There's one last thing to know about compound names. There are several acids that have their own special names. They don't follow the system we just talked about. For example, HCl. This molecule is made up of two nonmetals, so using the system we just described, you might want to call it hydrogen monochloride. But that would be very unusual. Almost everyone knows this compound 
as hydrochloric acid. Most acids have their own special names like this. Here are five that I would like you to know the names of. If I ask you for the name of one of these acids, this is what I'm looking for, not the name that you'd get if you used the system we talked about earlier. Well, that's it for this chapter. We'll start the next chapter in the book next time, and we'll use everything that we just learned about compounds and their formulas and names. I hope you'll join me for the videos for that chapter. In the meantime, have a good week.